Good morning, everyone. My name is Fred Ridley, and I serve as chairman of Augusta National Golf Club in the Masters Tournament. On behalf of our membership, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 87th Masters Tournament. I would like to introduce two of my fellow members who are with me today. To my right is Jim Heiler, chairman of our competition committees, and to my left is Tom Nelson, chairman of our media committee. Both Jim and Tom play important roles in conducting the Masters, and I thank both of them. I'm happy to begin today by reporting that our Masters Tournament Foundation initiatives are firmly back on schedule and stronger than ever. I want to commend Rose Zhang on her victory in the 2023 Augusta National Women's Amateur, as well as our eight new drive, chip, and putt national champions and everyone who participated in those events. These competitions have added to the excitement of the weekend leading up to the Masters and validate that the health of our game is extremely promising as interest in golf continues to build. A perfect example of this is less than two miles away at the Augusta Municipal Golf Course. I would draw your attention to the two screens. The patch, as the course is fondly known, has built a legendary reputation among locals as a place where the game is introduced and taught, where diversity is celebrated, and where friendships are forged. All would agree the patch is a valued community asset. Our commitment to the Augusta community equals our commitment to the game of golf. I'm therefore proud to announce today Augusta National's intent to support a joint partnership with the Patch, Augusta Technical College, and the First Tee of Augusta to usher in a new era for public golf in our city. Initially, there will be three components to this program. First, under the leadership of Dr. Jermaine Whirl, our alliance with Augusta Tech will instill formal education programs that produce the next generation of golf's workforce. These initiatives will be aligned with those in place of the first tee of Augusta, which will link these two facilities for the first time and expand their collective reach within the community. Most importantly, the resulting synergies will produce innovative programming, providing an affordable and welcoming pathway for anyone who wants to learn the game. And finally, we will assist in the master planning and renovation of both courses to present a public golf experience for residents and visitors to pursue a lifelong relationship with the game. We can't wait to get started with this partnership. We hope it will be a model for other communities. To celebrate this occasion, I am privileged to recognize several key stakeholders in attendance today. Augusta Technical College, the First Tee of Augusta, Augusta Municipal Golf Course, the City of Augusta, and the State of Georgia. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for your commitment to our community and the future of this game. We look forward this week to the 2022 Masters champion, Scotty Scheffler, defending his title against an outstanding field. 88 competitors are here representing 23 countries, including for the first time Poland, with the invitation earned by Adrian Moronk. Among our seven amateurs will be Australia's Harrison Crow, who won the 2022 Asia Pacific Amateur Championship, and our Argentina's Mateo Fernandez de Oliveira, who in record-setting fashion captured the 2023 Latin America Amateur Championship in Puerto Rico. Another amateur competing this week with a special invitation is Vanderbilt University sophomore Gordon Sargent. Gordon is the current NCAA Division I men's individual champion. Beginning in 2024, the reigning Division I champion will be a listed qualification category 
to receive a master's invitation. In addition, future NCAA Division I women's individual champions will be invited to compete in the Augusta National Women's Amateur. These additions to our qualifications are in recognition of the impressive quality of today's collegiate game and in continued respect to Bobby Jones, who believed in the importance of the best amateurs in the world competing at Augusta National. Beginning next year, the Masters Tournament Invitation Criteria also will include two revisions based on recent changes to the PGA Tour. The full list for 2024 invitations will be published at the conclusion of this press conference. As all of you know, the subject of the 13th hole has been a topic of discussion for several years. After careful evaluation this summer, we moved the tee back, adding 35 yards to the scorecard. We believe this modification will put a driver in play more often and restore the element of risk and reward that was intended in the original design of the hole. I would add that the planning and expertise of our agronomy and horticulture teams ensured that the finished work of this product maintained the dramatic beauty of Amen Corner. More broadly, the subject of distance remains topical. A few weeks ago, the RNA and USGA proposed a model local rule that reduces distances at the men's elite level. As the comment period remains open, we will be respectful of the process as the USGA and the RNA consider this important issue. We have been consistent in our support of the governing bodies, and we restate our desire to see distance addressed. I hope all of you will take the opportunity to see our newly renovated Par 3 course. We're excited that both players and patrons will enjoy a special experience today at the Par 3 contest. Work completed over the summer features a new look on the first five holes, along with new patron merchandise and concession services. In addition to matters related to the Masters competition, I should note that this year marks the 10th anniversary of Berkman's Place, a facility some would say is the greatest hospitality venue in all of sports. This milestone is a perfect occasion to share that work is underway to introduce the tournament's first official hospitality program outside our gates. This facility will be located across Washington Road, just a short walk to the North Gate. We plan to unveil the first phase of this exciting offering next year, which underscores our commitment to meet the evolving expectations of our patrons and guests. We are confident demand for this offering will, be, will, be far, exceed, will far exceed the supply of tickets. And beginning today, we are collecting information on masters.com for those who are interested. Further details will become available in the coming months. You may remember that several years ago, we successfully launched our first video game with EA Sports. In response to demand for an enhanced experience, we've returned to the EA platform with the launch of Road to the Masters. We saw the excitement for the first time this past Sunday evening, just down the hall in the arena, with the Road to the Masters Invitational. This celebrity contribution, uh, con competition rather, included Masters participant Tony Finau and was played in front of an enthusiastic live audience representing the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Augusta, the First Tee of Augusta, Payne College, and many other groups. This week, we celebrate the conclusions of two historic Masters careers. Sandy Lyle and Augusta's own Larry Mize both have announced that the 87th Masters Tournament will be their finalist competitors as they were in 1988 when Larry presented the green jacket to Sandy. They are connected again this week. We commend them for their fine play over four decades and for representing the Masters so well. 
Rest assured, their victories will forever be remembered. <coughs> I want to close by acknowledging a debt of thanks to the builders of the Masters and of our wonderful game. <coughs> Legends who have created history and truly a tradition like, unlike any other. These champions all are Masters heroes. They also are champions of the men's professional game, a game that, as we know, is currently experiencing a divide. It is appropriate that today's players, all players, pause to respect and appreciate the opportunities that went, the opportunities made possible by the heroes and champions who went before them. As important, I hope they will follow the examples of their predecessors to serve the game of golf and benefit the next generation. Golf brings people together, and I'm equally hopeful this week in Augusta can be the beginning of a path forward for our game. With that, Tom, I'm happy to take a few questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, please remember to speak directly into the microphone. First question, Brad. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Chairman Ridley, I want to go back to your announcement about the Masters Tournament Foundation project here in Augusta at the Patch. This makes two huge announcements in recent years that are transforming this city, thanks to Augusta National Golf Club. So the question is, in the wake of the hub for community innovation and this changing and updating of the patch, how important is your relationship with the city of Augusta? And if you can, what do you foresee in the future for other projects going forward? Well, thanks for that question. Uh, I'll start by saying uh, the importance uh, of the community to Augusta National is founded in our mission statement. And I've got it, I've got it right here. You've probably seen this green card that we all carry around. Uh, it basically says that we are committed to our community as one of our underlying principles. And so if we are true to that principle, then we will continue to look for opportunities to contribute back to the community. Uh, certainly the hub and the Boys and Girls Club was a great start that was done uh, in partnership with several of our, uh, our, our sponsor partners, which we are very appreciative. And uh, we just, we have been thinking about and looking for opportunities to really move the needle in uh, introducing people of all, uh, <coughs> of, of all different backgrounds and, uh, and economic backgrounds to, to the game of golf. And we thought that the best place to do that was right here in our community. And so we're really excited. I had an opportunity to visit the patch and the Boys and Girls Club. Um, it has, you know, as the saying goes, it has wonderful bones. I mean, it's a fantastic facility. It's got uh, great history, great traditions. And so that's the perfect combination for us to partner with uh, the, the organizations I mentioned uh, earlier uh, to really make a difference in the community. And, and what I'm most excited about, or as excited about, I should say, is if we're successful working together on this project, I really do think that it's a model for other communities. And we are very interested in, in taking this uh, on the road, as we say, but right now our focus is right here in Augusta. Thank you. Doug. You mentioned back in, in December in clarifying the participation of, of live players that your criteria is constantly um, under review. I wanted to ask you what would prompt changes, which apparently are coming, but I don't know how to ask you about them because I'm not sure what they are. Well, I mean, I think, you know, when you look at the changes that I mentioned uh, that are going to be in place for 2024, uh, they're fairly uh, administrative, I think would be the best word. Um, the reason for that statement uh, in December was, was really to uh, sort of disabuse the notion that we might not be making any changes in the future. It wasn't to specifically have you anticipate that we were going to make some major announcement, although that could be the, 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 uh, the case. Um, we do look at our qualifications every year. Uh, there, there, there are changes, there are, things are evolving, and we need to make sure that we're flexible in that regard. Uh, so I'm sure there will be changes in the future, but none beyond what I announced this morning. Gary. Mr. Chairman, in 2019, the Masters was played 
in the aftermath of the release of the Distance Insights Report. You were asked then about hole number 13, um, and you also said, and, and this is what you said then, uh, that, that my preference would be to see what, what happens with the governing bodies and what they decide is best for the game, then we will take the appropriate action in response to that. This modified local rule is their action. Uh, and as you mentioned, you're going to respect the comment period. Is your position, though, to support this proposal? Our position has always been that we, uh, we, we support the governing bodies. Um, I think uh, in a general sense, we do support the proposal. But because it's, it's in the middle of, an, of a comment period, um, it could change. Um, the whole purpose of the comment period is to take input from the industry. And so we will look at the final product and then make a decision. But generally, we have always been supportive of the governing bodies. Um, you know, I've stated that we believe distance needs to be addressed. So I think the natural conclusion is yes, we will be, we will be supportive. Alan. Chairman, we've seen uh, the leaders of the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour here this week. Did the club extend an invitation to Greg Norman in his capacity as Liv's commissioner and what considerations went into whatever decision you all reached? Uh, we did not extend an invitation uh, to Mr. Norman. Um, the, 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 the primary issue and the driver there is that um, I want the focus this week to be on, on the Masters competition, on the great players that, uh, that are participating, the greatest players in the world, which by our decision in December, we ensured that we were going to honor and be consistent with our invitation criteria. I would also add that in the last 10 years, uh, Greg Norman has only been here twice. And I believe one of those was as a uh, commentator for Sirius Radio. Uh, but it, it really was, was, was to um, keep the focus on the competition. Ben. Mr. Chairman, in the recent years, uh, amateurs have received more exemptions into professional events. I wonder if you can share some additional thoughts on the current state of amateur golf and maybe what led to the decision to make sure that the NCAA champions are here in the Masters. Well, I think um, it would be hard not to acknowledge that uh, amateur sports you know, as a whole are evolving. Certainly that there's no... Uh, Amateur golf is no exception, but I still do believe that there is a important place in amateur golf in this country. I mean, most, most golfers are amateurs. You know, most golfers will not uh, have the ability nor the desire to make golf their profession. Um, it really goes back to our, our roots, and that is that uh, Bobby Jones was the greatest amateur of all time. Uh, he believed in the importance of amateurs in the Masters. Um, I had the personal experience of uh, enjoying that on three different occasions, and I can tell you that it changed my life. Um, so we're, we're very proud and pleased to give this opportunity this year to seven players. And I think as it relates uh, to the NCAA champion, as I stated, um, you know, that is a major amateur championship. And I thought it was time that we acknowledge that. And we couldn't be happier to have Gordon here this week. He's a fine young man and a heck of a player. So we're, uh, we're, we're codifying that now going forward. Jamie in the back. Mr. Chairman, the majority of players, I would say, who've been in this room this week have suggested more often than not they'll, they'll be laying up on the 13th this week. Do, do you have any concerns that we won't see as much drama or excitement in that hole as we have in previous years? Well, I think a lot of that really depends on the weather. Um, um, but the, I've anecdotally, I mean, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, have information from several players that have played practice rounds during the, in the fall and, and early spring. I played two weeks ago with Scotty Scheffler. He had a five iron uh, into the whole one day. So while I think you may be right that the data will show that more players will, will lay up, I think for a still large number who will go for the green in two, I think it's going to be a much more challenging, a much more exciting shot. And I certainly look forward on Sunday to having someone in competition with a three or four iron in their hand or even a hybrid 
hitting, hitting a shot into the 13th hole rather than an 8-iron. So I think on balance, it's going to prove to be the right, the right decision. Scott. Mr. Chairman, uh, the qualifications changes we'll see in a little while are regarding PGA Tour. Uh, and many of the qualifications are sort of in partnership with the PGA Tour. Uh, has there been any consideration for other pathways for some other world tours like the Europe or Japan to get in other than just the world rankings? Yeah, we actually have discussed that. We, and that may w well be something we do, we do in the future. Um, you know, we, we really want to make sure that the Masters tournament field is representative of the best players in the world. So we're constantly looking at those possibilities. Um, our conclusion for the time being is that the uh, official world golf rankings is a, a really good way to, uh, you know, to, uh, to invite players. You know, it's an objective criteria based on um, you know, data-driven analytics. It's consistently applied, and I think most would agree it's, it's a good system. Christine. Thank you, Tom. Hi, Frank. Good to see you. Back in December, you used the words regrettably diminishing the virtues of the game uh, and the meaningful legacies of those who built it. You said you were disappointed, presumably uh, because of the golfers who left their jobs and went into business with the Saudis, responsible, of course, for 9-11, the murder and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, terrible, abysmal human rights violations. So now they're here, obviously. Uh, you've got 18 here. The picture last night was six of them. Are you at all concerned that you are actually helping the Saudis sports wash uh, because of their joy in seeing a picture like that last night? Are you helping them uh, actually sports wash their reputation? Well, let me go back. Um let me go back to our statement, and then we'll, we'll go. That was a long question, Christine, but I'll, I'll try to start from the beginning. Um, our statement in December, and, and, and particularly the comment um, that these actions had diminished the virtues of the game, um, I want to make a couple of points. First is, um, I know many of these players who are no longer on the PJ Tour. Some of them I would consider friends, so anything I might say is not a comment, a personal comment against their character or anything else. What I was trying to point out was that, and I alluded to it in my comments, that the platform that these players have built their careers on were, were, were based on the blood, sweat, and tears of their predecessors. People like Ben Hogan and Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, Tom Watson, Tiger Woods. I uh, have the I have the privilege of being a member, a partner, in a law firm that's 180 years old, and we exist today because of many generations of lawyers who thought it was important to leave our organization better than they found it. And so I, I, this is just my personal opinion. Doesn't mean that everyone has to think this way. So, so my comment in December was really more that um, I, I was expressing some disappointment that, that these players were taking the platform that had been given to them, that they rightly had earned success on, by the way, and moving to another opportunity, perhaps not thinking about who might come, from, come behind them. Um, as it relates to your comment about sports watching, I certainly have a general understanding of the term. I think, um, um, you know, it's for others to decide exactly what that means. Uh, these were personal decisions of these players, um, which I, you know, at a, at a high level don't necessarily agree with. But um, it really wasn't intended to go beyond that. Jeff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a little bit on that topic of players. Uh, have many players come to you and asked you about uh, what the distance issue has meant in terms of cost and burden uh, for this golf course and the way it plays compared to when you first played it, um, because many have been very critical. And I'm, I'm just curious if, if many have asked you questions or if you've been able to explain to them some of the, the more uh, difficult uh, elements to the, to the topic of distance. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the players who have uh, I've spoken with would be no surprise to you. It's been players that have been pretty consistent over the years, not just as it relates to Augusta National, but just as to the issue of distance generally, how they feel about it. Um, you know, I, I've read some of the recent comments about the, uh, the uh, model local rule, and there certainly are a number of players who have voiced opposition to it. Um, um, I'm sure there are reasons for those opinions. Uh, I would also say that uh, equally on the other side, there's some pretty notable players who have very strong opinions that this is the right thing to do. You know, in our case, um, um, my focus has always been on this competition and on the Augusta National Golf Course. Um, the, the, the Augusta National for many, many years, for decades, when I played in the tournament in 1976, 7, and 8, it was about 6,900 yards. Um, when Tiger Woods won the tournament in 1997 for the first time, it wasn't, was about that distance. It wasn't until a few years later that, um, you know, that, that distance was increased. I think once, maybe the year after in 98, and then more particularly and significantly in 2002. And I think what's happened since then is while those appeared to be sort of very significant changes, and they were at the time, but over the years, players have gotten stronger, They've, uh, their swings have become more efficient, the equipment has gotten better, and so it didn't take long, if, if, if at all, to catch up to those changes. And I suspect the same thing will happen here. Um, and I, and I'm saying, I will say that regardless of what ultimately happens with the, with the local uh, model rule. Um, so yes, I, I do listen to players. I, we had a great evening last night at the Champions Dinner, and I, as I do every year, I solicited the input of all of our champions. And uh, I told them that we typically don't take a lot of suggestions, but that they, were, they had the license to <laughs> feel free to do so. So I hope some more of them will talk to me. Alex. Mr. Chairman, two times in your opening remarks and then your response to Gary, you mentioned uh, that you wanted distance addressed. Financially, if you were required to make your own ball because the manufacturers would not, would you do it? I don't think that's a practical solution. I mean, I, I know I'm very familiar with, uh, with, with Hootie Johnson's comments, as, as you all are, uh, uh, about 20 years ago. And I, I think that, I think Hootie was trying to make a point that that's something that if we decided we wanted to do it, we could do it, but I don't think it's a practical solution. Joy. Chairman, uh, something that uh, Scott actually alluded to, but w the, you are also a part of the OWGR board, the, the Augusta National. The thing is that in the past one year or so, it has become so PGA Tour centric that there are just about three players from DP World Tour who are part of the top 50 and none from Japanese Tour, Asian Tour, Australian Tour, any other place. Uh, and that's why it becomes very important that what you're saying, the changes of qualification criteria, if you so strongly believe in the fact that the OWGR is in the right place, I just wanted to know, I mean, how can these players now, without getting into the top 50, top 60 of the world, how can they get into the Masters tournament? Well, I think that illustrates, you know, one of the big issues of the topic of the day, and that is, you know, what pathways are there, you know, on these tours to, to move up the ladder, if I understand your question correctly. Um, while, we, while we strongly believe the World, world golf rankings are uh, is a is a good way to measure uh, success and, and eligibility for tournaments. You know, you do raise a good question, and I and I had a question just a minute ago uh, relating similar to that about considering uh, top players from other tours, um, and and we'll do that. Uh, we've talked about it in the past. Uh, I'm not saying we're going to make any changes in that regard, but we will we will consider that. I do think that one of the things that realistically we have to think about is um, we have to look at the, I mean, I realize this is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but we have to realize the strength of fields in those other tours. And from time to time, you'll have someone break, break, out, break out, you know, do something significant enough perhaps to get in a higher level tournament and then the 
and then the progression continues. But I think the, you know, one of the answers long term is to develop the game in those regions where there are more and more players and more and more good players. I mean, a good example of that, I think, <clears throat> at the amateur level has been the two championships that we're involved with, with the RNA and the USGA. We've seen the same pattern happen in Asia that's now happening in Latin America. And that is that the first couple of years in Asia, there were some really good players at the very top of the field, but it wasn't very deep. It's getting, it's now where perhaps early on there were eight players who could win. There are probably now 28 players who can win. And the bottom of the field is getting stronger. Uh, we said when we started in Latin America that we hoped that same progression and trajectory would take place in Latin America, and it has. Um, you know, you just have to look at the college ranks. There are, I think we had 43 players in the field this year in Puerto Rico who were playing collegiate golf in the United States. So the real solution, I think, is to grow the game in these areas, produce better golfers for these tours that will then uh, legitimize uh, consideration of performance on those tours to get into bigger tournaments. But it's something we think about a lot. Maybe just two more questions. Brent? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to ask, follow up on the Greg Norman question from earlier. Um, Greg spoke in Australia last week and he said he doesn't think he'll ever be welcome back at Augusta. Can I get your response to that? I'm not sure I understood that. Greg, Greg spoke in Australia, in Australian media last week, Greg Norman, and said he doesn't think he will ever be welcome back at Augusta. Welcome back here. Are you asking will he ever be welcome back? Yes. I just want to get your response to that. I mean, I, it's hard to answer that question because, you know, uh, I, you know I don't know, you know where, where the world's going to be next year or two years from now. But as I stated, um, you know, I would say, I would never say never. But I told you why he had not been invited this year. Um, um, I, um, I think that, um, as I said in my comments, I'm hopeful. I, I've, noticed, I've noticed a tone. The tone has been really good here this week. I've noticed that players are interacting. Last night at the Champions Dinner, um, I, you know, it, it, I, 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 I would not have known that anything's going on in the world of professional golf other than the norm. Um, so I think, I think, and I'm hopeful that this week might get people thinking in a little bit different direction and, and things will change. So I would never say never, no. Uh, last question, Sam. Um, Mr. Chairman, over here. Uh, my interest is in the green jacket itself. And uh, I wonder, you referenced your three appearances as, as an amateur. I wonder if the club asked you for your measurements, for your jacket measurements when you were an amateur, and, and uh, if you have any personal stories about the green jacket itself. About whether they asked your personal measurements when you became played as an amateur, and any personal reflections no, on personal, the green jacket. I'm sorry. I, I'm, uh, my wife tells me I'm hard of hearing, and I think she's probably right. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Did they ask for your measurements? Yeah. Um, wow. I, you know, I have a lot. I have a lot of reflections. I mean, we don't have enough time, you know, in this press conference for me to, to give all of them to you. Um, you know, one of the uh, the first day I was chairman, uh, our staff, our senior staff, and people in the office came in uh, to my office with this framed picture of me walking down one of the fairways during the 1976 Masters with Jack Nicklaus. And uh, I'd never seen that picture before. It's sort of been all over the place since then. But, um, and, uh, and it was because we digitized all our photographs, it had this incredible clarity as if it was taken the week before. And so certainly that day, uh, that day with Jack um, was something I'll ever remember. I, fortunately, I, I knew him a little bit, so it wasn't quite as you know, daunting teeing up with him, but it was still still pretty daunting. I remember um, uh, the uh, he, he shot 67 that day and hit 17 greens and two putted every par five for a birdie, maybe a birdie somewhere else. But I remember we had played eight holes and I just birdied the uh, eighth hole to go one under to tie him at one under for the moment. And and we got to the ninth hole and I hit a really good drive 
And uh, I was starting to feel a little bit cocky. And so I, I turned and made eye contact with Jack, like, okay. <laughs> and he s- sort of smiled, teed it up, and hit it about 50 yards past me, <laughs> you know. And, and then he kind of looked at me and winked. And, uh, and so, um, but I have, I have a lot of great memories. Staying in the crow's nest, I mean, the, you know, it was really the beginning of my relationship with this club. And I've been here every year since then, so. I was thinking of the garment itself, the actual green jacket. If, if you have any memories about, um, yeah, you know, well, obviously even won one. But. I remember I was really happy when I got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the green jacket has a, does have a great history. And, uh, um, I mean, and, you know, I think, uh, I think it's, it's a story that, that, you know, we, we've tried to tell a little more, uh, in a little more detail in, in the recent years. And uh, as, as I think you know, we've, uh, we've dedicated a part of our, uh, of our golf shop uh, to, uh, to the story of the Green Jacket. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that um, not only is a privilege to wear one, but it's something certainly, I know there were about 32 people in a room last night who value that very much. And I think that you know, we talk about all these issues in golf, but we're here this week, to, uh, and these 88 players, that's, that's all that's on their mind is playing for that green jacket. So um, it's a great symbol of, uh, uh, of celebration of this game, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing uh, someone have it, uh, donning it on Sunday afternoon. Well, on that note, that concludes our press conference. Thank you for your time today and enjoy the 87th Masters Tournament.